What is the difference between an entity and the names that are used to refer to that entity? We often overlook the fact that a person's name is just an arbitrary collection of character symbols, usually assigned by other individuals and used as a tag or a handle to refer to that person. There's nothing intrinsically definite about an individual's name, nor is it particularly unique or distinguishing. In fact, one person might be known by a number of names, each meaningful within a specific context. Here's an example. Ty Cobb, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, was also referred to by his nickname, the Georgia Peach. On the other hand, that same name might be used to refer to a completely different entity in some different context as well. We'll use the same example. The name Georgia Peach is also used to refer to a variety of peach that grows in the state of Georgia. The same holds true for objects as well as individuals. The same type of screw may be assigned hundreds of different product codes by the different manufacturers, distributors, and retail vendors, despite the exact similarity of their engineering characteristics. So we can basically see the dual nature of the problem of unique identity. On one hand, we have multiple name representations referring to a single entity, while on the other, we have multiple entities referred to using the same name. Perhaps the famous playwright William Shakespeare had some hidden experience as a data management professional dealing with this issue. Juliet has captured the essence of the problem. It is the name that is the enemy, and the object of her affection is the core of the person with the family name of Montague, despite the name. When it comes to the names of business entities, it gets a little more complicated. Financial instruments, bank accounts, commercial business accounts, etc., often take their names as a combination of the type of interaction and the parties involved. This example shows a handful of records extracted from a publicly released data set, and it shows some of the complexity of entity naming. Looking at the first record in this set, we see that the actual name of the entity spans multiple columns. This means that we need to pull out all three columns and concatenate them together to get the actual name of the entity. From that name, we can start to parse out the individual entities. First, there is the account itself, which takes a specific name based on the grantor. In turn, we see that there are two parties named as trustees. Each of these can be pulled out in turn. So in essence, we really have at least three entities associated with this record. Applying this process to all the records, we can actually see that the 10 records in the data set contain references to 27 different names. We as humans can see that some of these probably refer to the same real-world entities, but a computer program naively comparing character strings would not necessarily have that same experience. That is where identity resolution comes in. Identity resolution is a collection of algorithms used to parse, standardize, normalize, and then compare data values to establish that two records refer to the same entity or to determine that they don't. By feeding the set of records into the identity resolution process, we can determine that all of these records contain a reference to a unique entity. And not only that, we can use data culled from all of those records to materialize a high quality representation containing a name, middle initial, and a last name. In essence, we have resolved the representations that determine that they all refer to the same real world entity. An iterative process then continues to not just look at the data, but also to parse out relationships embedded within those data values. As we saw earlier, the word trustee indicates a business relationship between a party and a financial account. Here, we start to distinguish between classes of entities, say accounts or financial products, and parties, individuals associated with those financial instruments, and then map the relationships between those two object classes. Then we can look at how individual parties are related to one another as a byproduct of their correlated associations. So in fact, not only do we see who is who, but we also get a deeper view into interrelationships. The ability to suss out unique identities from large data sets such as customer interactions and purchases and determine relationships provides knowledge that can be used to support additional business optimizations. That's it for this video podcast. In future podcasts, we'll explore algorithms that are used for identity resolution and how they are applied to specific data records to measure and report scores used to establish similarity between records. This is David Lotion, President of Knowledge Integrity, and if you've got questions, you can email me at lotion, L-O-S-H-I-N, at knowledge-integrity.com. Thanks. <music>